This is Ryan Elliott for Boxing Social in association with Betfred. I'd like to be joined by Nicholas Slick Nick Sullivan today, unbeaten prospect from over stateside. Nick, how are you? I'm doing well, man. Thank you for having me. No, pleasure. Thank you very much for taking the, the time to join me. Uh, let, let's talk a bit about you today, first and foremost. I'd imagine it's been a bit of a frustrating year for you. You got going last year in the pro ranks. You haven't been able to get in the ring this year with everything going on. How have you been managing to keep busy during this time, though? Man, nah, I've just been, just been trying to stay self-motivated, stay working out. So when the time comes, I don't have to get ready. I'm always ready because I look at it like I've just been working out. I, if they can give me a date tomorrow, I'll be ready tomorrow. That's how bad I'm ready to get back in the ring because it's, it's been since October. So we're going over a little over six months without being active in the ring. And yet that's, it's not a good way to start off the career, but there's nothing that we could do about it or Golden Boy could do about it. Now, sort of following the news and, and seeing that Bob Arum's starting to put on shows, there's talk of a few yeah. shows over in the UK, dates being rearranged and stuff. Have yeah. you heard anything yet with regards to when you could be back in the ring? You say, are you staying ready? Nah, yeah, I'm staying ready for when I do get a date. But right now, I don't think Golden Boy has any card made or anything right now. So I'm just staying ready. So when that time do come, I can be the first one on the card because I'm, I'm ready. I've been itching to get back in there. That's the big question that everybody always asks. Me. You know when you're going to fight again? I have no idea. Now, while well, we got the time today, Nick, I thought we'd talk a bit more about your background. It's the first time we've had you on the channel okay. talk a bit about your roots into boxing before we come into your career. So okay. just take it way back. How old were you when you first laced up the gloves? When I first started, when I first walked into the gym, I was seven, turning eight years old. Eight years old. And what was it that, that brought you down there? Was it a family thing as it often is in boxing? What was it? Well, I actually, it was actually, I had like, I would say like a temper. As a, as a kid, I always wanted to fight, like, keeping me out of trouble. Like, my mom just told me I need to take that energy and I, I need to take that negative energy and put it somewhere positive. So one of the coaches was in my mom's hair salon. My mom has a hair salon. One of the coaches was in my mom's hair salon. And that same day that my co the coach walked into my mom's hair salon, got into a fight in the back of my mom's hair salon. And then she talked to the coach, and she was like, this is why I need him to be in the gym. Like, you should just bring him past the gym. So one thing led to another. They brought me past the gym, and I just stuck with it. I was playing other sports but and still boxing. And then, like, 15, 14, 15 years old, boxing just took over. I just, I just put all my focus into boxing. That's all I wanted to do. You mentioned you were fighting in the back of your mum's salon there, and that's sort of where it all got going from. But... <laughs> <laughs> what was that like growing up in Virginia and being around your mum's salon and stuff like that? Was it was it happy upbringing? Talk to me about that. Yeah, yes, yes. I had I had a I had a very happy upbringing, and it's just you know it's violence everywhere. So violence in the city, and my mom didn't want me to be a part of that violence in the city. She she wanted me. My my mother and my father always wanted great for me. Like if any time I ever did wrong, I did wrong on my own. They raised me to do do right so it was it was a good upbringing but you know violence and gun violence gang violence all that so boxing was definitely uh, a savior for me because who knows what i would have been if i was I wasn't in the gym boxing who knows what could have happened when i wasn't at practice so boxing was definitely a savior for me kept me on the streets kept me motivated kept me my my mind on goals and not just being another statistic out here now, Nick, what age were you at? I know you said when you got in your teen years, you really started to excel and take it seriously. But at what point did you think, okay, this is more than a hobby now. This, this is my life. Um, I would say, I would say right after I won my first belt, and that was at 12, 12 or thirteen years old. And I was in my head, I'm like, I, I'm, I'm gonna go. So this is gonna be my job. I'm gonna go somewhere with this. Once I got my first belt, I just, I just knew it was just more to it after that. Because at first, before then, it was just more like a hobby, just something to do. And I'm just go to the gym, hit on the bag, spar, fight people. It was just something to do. And after I won my first belt, it was just like, this this, this going to take me somewhere. I just I just got that feeling like, this is it. Something you mentioned, Nick, and I think it's it's important we shed some light on this before we, we keep talking about all things boxing. You said that you're glad you found boxing because you didn't want to become another statistic of yes. something or the other. There's been a lot of unrest at the minute following the, the death of George Floyd. We've been talking about yes. it off camera just a little bit, uh, that sort of unrest. Yes. How are things in, in your part of the world right now? Well, our part, our part of the, all 50 states in America right now is rioting and we we, we, we standing together. Our, so like some some stuff like the the... 
the looting and some of the stuff. I understand it, but I, me personally, I wouldn't do it, but I, I definitely understand it because it's, it's been going on for too long and we're just tired of, we're just tired of being tired. So I, I definitely understand where it's coming from, but the, I just think we should more so of not so not so violent, but I think we should more so like ride in a in more of a peaceful way, and we we we're going to be heard because all fifty states is doing it. So all fifty states they can't deny us. So all fifty states doing it. So I just I I understand it, but it's 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 crazy in my part of the world right now. Now you said it. Uh, a lot of particularly the African American. Uh, community are sick of the way things are and sick of the way they've been treated for years if, if not centuries yeah. you know um yeah is, is that something you you've sort of grown up with like inequality and and, and race division in virginia what is your experience yeah. of that it's, 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 it's always it's always been like that like you know how we have you got you got crimes where people kill people it's it seemed like the officers are killing my kind, my people, our black people, the the same amount as people killing people. So it's just like the cops are part of the a part of the criminal system as well, and they're doing it on camera and getting away with it. And that's that's clearly not fair. But you do, you know how you have it's it's rare you have a case. You have some cases well, okay, you 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 do have to use force, but in a lot of cases you don't, and they're doing it anyway. They're they're abusing their authority and we're tired of being tired and it's not fair. And it's just like, it's only us that's, that's getting it done to. We have, and I, I have, I seen some of my Caucasian and white friends on Twitter venting about it, saying they, some of the crimes, one of the George Floyd, George Floyd crimes, they got arrested for it. He said he got arrested for it. And now he tell, he tell it at parties as a funny story. Why couldn't George Floyd have that same same privilege to be able to tell that that story at a at a uh, party or something like why he had to die for no reason and he was in handcuffs he wasn't resisting arrest he was in handcuffs and he told him he can't breathe as an officer i'm pretty sure they're trained to know when you can't breathe turn him to a side he's in handcuffs what can he do and it's four officers yeah very powerful words there nick obviously steered the attention away from boxing but just think it's important well you know you're living through this and so many people are living through this it's important we we give it the platform it's not something i can relate to it's not something i've experienced yeah. but yes i think we do need to talk about it and be open about things like that so thank, thank you very much for sharing those powerful words uh let's let's sort of steer things back towards your career and, and sort of okay yes sir uh, you won several national titles as an amateur. You were eyeing yes, up the sir. Olympics. I've I've seen interviews with you in little snippets where you're talking about Tokyo 2020, and and that was a goal. Then yes. you signed with Golden Boy and and Term Pro. This this big move for yourself. What happened? Well, um, Olympics. I've always been a dream of, a dream of mine as well. But I always told myself like whichever one came first, because you know opportunities come and go, and I don't want to miss any opportunity that I should have that I want to go back and be like dang, I should have took that opportunity or dang, I should have did this. So we not, we don't, I don't really jump too fast on anything because you jump too fast, it can crumble back against you as well. So I took my time, but pro came first. Golden Boy threw a contract out there first, and I just signed with Golden Boy. And, and another thing is with this virus going on, the 2020 Olympics have been pushed back. So now what if I didn't sign with Golden Boy and that contract went away? And now I'm stuck trying to do Olympics, but now I got to wait a whole nother year to do the Olympics. So, you know, it worked out. You've obviously turned over. You've had two fights so far. What have been the main changes you've been making in the gym, style-wise particularly, going forward? Style-wise, I will be more technique more technique, and placing my punches. So amateur is just more of a point system. So you, it just go, it's a matter about who's the busiest and who's landing more, more punches. Pros is a tad bit different. It's more precise technique and more powerful punches. So it's just like you can't just go in there and just throw punches, just pity pat punches, because that's that that won't work only in the amateur. So it's not too much of a difference, but it's a difference. Now your first couple of fights have been just sort of above the super featherweight limit, uh, just under lightweight. Where do you sort of see yourself settling when you sort of get back into that rhythm? Um, I, I see myself right back at 135, but me and my team was in talks about going down to 130 because they, they picture me because I'm 
tall for my weight class. So they pitched me at 130. They would say, oh, you, you'll you be a problem. You'll be a monster at 130. You can make 130. It's, it's up for you from there. So we, we've we been talking about it. So gym's back, open back up Friday. We're going to work on my weight. We're going to try to get back down. And we haven't made any promises yet because I'm I'm a naturally big guy and we am still growing. So we don't want to make any promises, but we see what we can do. Now, as you look at the landscape, obviously very early days in your professional career, when you look at super featherweight, when you look at lightweight, you've got a very good young lightweight in your promotional stable with you, Ryan Garcia. Yeah. Is there anyone, when you, you look at the, the world scene at the minute of those two weights, that you think maybe one day I would like to fight that guy? Anybody you'd love to share a ring with down the line? Anybody I would love to share with down the line. Like, it's not, I, don't, I don't pinpoint out anybody, but I want, I want anybody that's at the top. So if anybody's at the top, I want them. Like, I want all the top dogs. The only way to be a top dog is to beat the top dogs and fight the top dogs. So, with that being said, Ryan Garcia, that that's one dude that came up in the amateurs with me. Devin Haney, another dude came in up in the amateurs with me. Um, who else is at the 135? Of course, Tank, but these these are guys that, that's been in there longer than me. These are guys that's 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 more seasoned than me. But So, my time is coming. I'm not rushing anything, but Eventually, they will, they'll see me. They'll eventually they'll see me. You say eventually they'll see you. It seems like there's a very exciting time sort of brewing for this lightweight division. You've got Lomachenko considered the top dog, pound for pound number one in many people's eyes. He's going to be taking on Tiafimo, another great young fighter. Yes. You mentioned the likes yes. of Brian Garcia, Devin Haney, you're yes. around, an amateur. Who do you yes. see after Lomachenko asserting themselves as that number one out of those sort of four guys, if you had to pick one? That's kind of that's kind of hard because it's a lot of all them guys are hungry, so it's it's it makes it kind of hard because it's like I could choose like Ryan Garcia, but then again I could like oh Devin Haney doing this and oh Tefimo look doing this, so it's just like I don't know it's ever who wanted who wanted the most because all them guys are hungry right now like they they want that top spot and they're doing well they're doing very good for themselves so it could be anybody so it's just a is this a race of who wanted the most? Devin obviously has been capturing a lot of headlines recently. Uh, because he appears to have been taken under the wing of Floyd Mayweather. Floyd Mayweather yeah. was always his idol, sort of growing up, yeah. spent a lot of time around Floyd. Floyd's been yeah. doing hard work with him. He's been showing him around his mansion, taking him on private yeah. jets. What did you make of all that, seeing all that Devin sort of working alongside Floyd? Um, see, it could be it could be pros and cons to that. Pros is Oh, he, he, it depends on the fighter as well. So pros to it, he could be like, oh, this could be me one day. I could have this. I could have this. All I got to do is keep grinding, keep working. All I got to do is do this and do that. Like you could use that. Some people may use that as motivation, but then you have others that's like, oh, they feel like they made it already because they're around it and they, oh, I'm, I'm good. I'm around it. He going to always like, so, so it's pros and cons to that. But I just hope Devin is taking it in as a, as a pro and, he like, and he's using it as motivation, like, oh, this could be me. This could be me next. All I got to do is focus. All I got to do is, is keep doing me, standing in the gym, training, winning fights, and this could be me next. I could be the next Money Mayweather of boxing. Now, I mentioned there that Floyd has always been an idol. Devin, growing up, yeah. who were your sort of boxing idols when you, when you started getting involved and started watching and educating yourself a bit more of the sport? Who did you look up to? Well, it was, it was a tie between Floyd Mayweather and Pernell Whitaker. Hmm. Pernell Whitaker. That was that was that was I would say that was my guy. He was actually he actually before he passed away in his funeral, he was actually in my gym. He always been around and helped me train. He was holding the bag for me while I was punching. He was just it it was just a he was a good guy. He was just a good guy that I wish he didn't let the uh the streets and the the drugs get to him because he was a he was an awesome guy, an awesome fighter as well. I spoke to Buddy McGirt about Penel Whitaker not too long ago. Obviously, Buddy fought him, and he said he was just so elusive. He was a defensive genius, and he was even though he's right in front of you, he was so damn hard to hit. What sort of, yeah. bits of advice and bits of wisdom was he giving you when you were working alongside him in the gym? Yes, he was. He was giving me all of that. He was telling me like, never stay stationary. He was like, you're tall, you got long arms. Never stay stationary. It's it's hard to hit a moving target. And as when I was younger, it was just like. Okay, like yeah, okay, I I get it. Like it's hard to move and move and target. That's obvious. But as I got older and my boxing style came more into play, I see what he meant now. Like the more you move, 
it's hard to get a punch landed on you. And if they do, it won't be full fledged punch because you're moving. They can't, you can't place a great punch on a moving target. So nine times out of 10, when guys are getting knocked out or out cold, they're stationary. It's stationary. And if they get dropped on the move, it's like a flash because it's, it's not a hard punch at all. Now, Nick, that, that first day that Penel Whitaker walks into the gym where you're training as an amateur, what is going through your mind when you're, you're working alongside and, and absorbing information from one of the yeah. greats of the sport? How was that for you? Um, well, actually, like, it was, it, was, it was very exciting. So it was just like, wow, I have a Hall of Famer, a world champ in my gym right now. Like, this, this, is, this is real. And then it's, it's so crazy because my mom – has her own hair salon and she does his ex-wife's hair so she, I, I was getting game from her and then getting game from her ex-husband when he came to the gym so it was like I got the best of both worlds. No Nick I'm sure you you traveled a bit as an amateur amateurs are, are renowned for having to go here there and everywhere did, did you get around yeah. quite a bit before you turned professional? Yes I actually did I actually I missed a lot of days of school too uh, for traveling for boxing events and I actually liked it not having to be in school, but yeah, I've been, I've been, I've been to almost, I could say almost all 50 states. In your professional career, is it something on your mind as well? Obviously, we're, we're a British-based channel, we do come over from time to time, is it on your mind yeah. in the pro ranks to, to fight abroad eventually, maybe even come over to the UK and see what the fans are like over here? That, that's all, that's crazy, that's always been a dream. That's always been a dream. As well as turning pro, I always wanted, I don't know why, I always wanted to fight overseas as an amateur, as a pro. I just wanted to get that feeling. I just, I, I love it. I want to I travel overseas for vacation, but my main dream is to fight overseas. Like, that's, that's a big dream for me. I have to get, the, I have to make that happen. Well, Slick Nick, coming to a country near you, everyone. But Nick, I'm not going to take any more of <laughs> your time. Thank you so much for joining me today. It's been a pleasure. All the best with your career. Hopefully you can get yourself some fight news soon and we'll catch up with you when you do so, I'm sure. Yes, sir. Thank you for having me on the show. I appreciate that.